under control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. If you would uh, join me for the invocation, Chaplain John Gerhardt. Mr. Chairman Greg Carter, would you bow your heads with me for our invocation? Lord our God, as we begin this meeting of our hospital board, we are mindful of the weighty task of providing care for those in need. From our trauma care to our intensive care, from our rehab facilities to our urgent care and diagnostic centers, from our emergency room to our operating rooms, from nursing care to neonatal, we find ourselves entrusted with the sacred task of ministering to the most fragile in our community, from the oldest to our very youngest. We ask your hand of mercy and comfort for the patients and families who seek our aid. And help us, we pray, to administer our attentions with the greatest of wisdom and the deepest of compassion. These things, together we pray. Amen. Join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll call the meeting to order of the Sarasota County Public Hospital Board, and we'll start with approvals of the orders of the day. Do we have a motion and a second? All those in favor of the orders of the day as written, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? The order's passed. And now the approval of the minutes of the meeting of April 18th. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, in, unless there are any questions or corrections, the uh, approval of the minutes stand. Any citizen desiring to address the hospital board should turn in a speaker card to the board secretary. If the citizen comments pertain to an item on the agenda today, the comment will be heard early in this meeting. Otherwise, it will be heard towards the end. Speakers are asked to limit their comments to five minutes. Vendors, suppliers, or other persons seeking hospital <coughs> contracts awarded on a competitive basis are reminded that their ability to address the board may be restricted by the terms of the invitation for bid, request for proposal, or other purchasing criteria. Lastly, the board has established a claims adjustment review panel comprised of representatives of the board, the medical staff, administration, and legal counsel to review and negotiate the settlement of claims. Accordingly, the board will not entertain comments on or discuss or negotiate claims at this meeting. And we'll start with board reports. I don't think we have board reports today. So we'll move to trauma update. Dr. Ahmad, if you would introduce our speaker today. Sure. I'm happy to introduce our medical director of trauma today, Dr. Alan Brockhurst. Thank you. I want to say good afternoon to the board. Um, I'm here to give a, kind of a one-year summary of what we've done with trauma in the past uh, year. Uh, as you, many of you know, uh, May 1st of last year, we became a provisional level two trauma center. So we just kind of celebrated our one-year uh, anniversary. So I want to look at some of the statistics um, and some of the things that we've done. Uh, on the first uh, slide, you can see here that although the initial prediction was that we would see somewhere in the order of three to 500 trauma patients, um, the top line shows the people that are admitted to the trauma registry. This includes everyone with a traumatic injury that spends more than 24 hours, you know, a day admission to the hospital at SMH. So you can see it's around close to 2,000 patients total in the trauma registry. Um, the people that were seen by the trauma service um, was um, just under 1,600 in that same time frame. Uh, and of those, we admitted about 1,235 um, patients, so a lot of a lot of new folks, uh, trauma injuries admitted to the hospital. And then the bottom line is the trauma alerts. These are the ones that meet the criteria for the trauma service to be activated immediately, whether it's by EMS or whether it's an internal alert through the emergency department. Um, these are the ones that kind of the sickest that they think we need to see them immediately. And so again, you can see there was um, almost 900 of them. And the numbers were increasing kind of by month. 
Um, so what happens to these patients? Well, this looks at just the trauma alerts, but there are similar breakdown with the trauma alerts as well as all the patients that we see. About 80% of them get admitted to the hospital. Um, a few um, are discharged right from the emergency department, about 15% or so. Uh, and then very few are transferred. Um, so we do have, again, the transfer arrangements with Tampa General for burns and for um, some of the complex injuries that we might not be able to deal with here. Um, and then, of course, all children's for the pediatric traumas. So about two a month or so are getting transferred out, so not a very big number. And then the mortality that you see there, about 1.7% um, are uh, die on arrival to the trauma bay. Um, if we look at our overall statistics, our overall mortality for the year was around 2.5%. Uh, the National Trauma Data Bank, um, the benchmark is about 4% nationally, so we're very proud of those numbers. Uh, when our site visitors were here, uh, the state site vi visitors have kind of complicated algorithms that they look at our statistics. And their comment was that with the mortality that we saw based off the, the, um, the risk factors and the injury severity scores that the people um, were seeing, they felt that, again, um, we're saving on the number we saw, um, total number we saw about 1,200, about 100 people we saved that but based off the statistics shouldn't be alive and with us. So again, we're very proud of that. Um, so. This slide looks at all admitted injured patients and where they're admitted to. So when we first got here and uh, started doing provisional uh, trauma uh, center work in May of last year, about 50-50 were admitted to a surgical service versus a medical service. These are trauma patients. The bottom line shows you that the American College of Surgery, which is where we hope to pursue our next verification, they, uh, their expectation is, is less than 10% are admitted to a medical service. So. Uh, they prefer that they and require that they be admitted to a surgical service. This might be someone with an orthopedic injury admitted to orthopedic service. It might be someone with a traumatic injury admitted to the trauma service. But they don't frequently like to see um, people with traumatic injuries admitted to the medical service. So over time, um, with continued education, again, when this is a very new program, we're making strides in that area So to the point that now about three-fourths of all the patients are admitted to the uh, surgical service, mostly trauma, and only one-fourth admitted to the medical service, but there's still work to do, and uh, Dr. Hammond and Dr. Taylor are helping us um, work on that with some of the educational pieces, like what constitutes a trauma patient, who is it that we need to be involved with and see. Um, trauma is very interested in our performance improvement, so we look at different projects, and um, so one of the things that we looked at early that we're proud of is we looked at the open fractures here. So open fractures are any you know, broken bone that pokes through the skin. These people are at high risk for infection. Um, and the literature shows us that the timeliness of antibiotics is very important. So they should get the antibiotics within about an hour or so. When we first started looking at this back in May of uh, last year when we got here, we actually saw that none of the patients were receiving the antibiotics in the time frame that was necessary. So we set this as kind of a goal for an area, obviously an opportunity for improvement. Um, we did a lot of education in the ER with nursing, with physicians. We talked to pharmacy about, you know, efficiency and how we can get them involved and, and make the process more streamlined so that people can be uh, given antibiotics in a timely fashion. Uh, we made uh, laminated cards to give to people so there was more awareness. Uh, and then ultimately what we did was we made it, and uh, as soon as an open fracture was identified, it was a stat consult to the trauma service so that we could help getting people administered antibiotics in a timely fashion. So now what we see is that we have 100% um, for the past four months straight. So we're really proud of that. And we like to do that in kind of different areas, anything that we find that we can improve. Um, overall, um, a, a hospital that becomes a trauma center, their overall mortality drops across the board for all patients, and that's what we call the halo effect. So because trauma is involved in so many aspects of the hospital, different services, whether it's ER, OR, ICU, floor, um, laboratory, pharmacy, et cetera, um, we try to kind of uh, improve performance across the board. So we've had two visits um, in the past year. One was from the Department of Health, state of Florida. Um, obviously, we have to be a Florida um, Department of Health uh, designated trauma center. Otherwise, EMS can't bring trauma patients here. So that was sort of the first step of pursuing this process. And our ap application went in April of last year. Uh, May 1st, we became a provisional trauma center. And then we had our site visit February 17th. So the site visitors from the state came. They were very impressed by our facilities and what we've done with the trauma program. 
Um, they noted some strengths and weaknesses, and we had kind of a, a time frame to respond to that. We sent our response back in, and we're waiting to hear, and we're feeling you know, very optimistic that we should hear back from them any day with um, uh, the fact that we'll be a verified level two trauma center. Um, they technically have until July 1st to get back to us, but we're hoping that we'll hear something sooner than that. Um, we also had American College of Surgeons consultative visit. Uh, so the kind of gold standard for trauma centers is to be verified by the ACS. So that is our, um, our goal is to, to get them um, to certify us as a trauma center as well. So what this was was a site visit to kind of um, get some pointers to when we're going to go through the application process, um, what are the strength and strengths and weaknesses that they see, what would they be looking for, what would they find would be you know, uh, not acceptable if they reviewed us so that we could kind of work to fix those things ahead of time to streamline the process for our review. So they were here March 28th and 29th. Again, they were very um, positive about uh, what, what they're seeing here with us in our kind of fledgling trauma center. Um, they issued um, um, kind of a response, um, and they noted some strengths and weaknesses overall of the hospital. They really liked the physical layout of the trauma base. Um, they were very impressed by the location of them, close proximity to the CT scanner, close proximity to the OR. Um, they were, ex you know, very happy that we have blood available in the trauma bay, um, as that can sometimes be difficult in traumas that need blood to get blood. Um, they're um, very impressed that our hospital serves as the regional blood bank. Um, uh, they were, you know, amazed by the amount of the volume of blood that we have available as compared to some of the hospitals that, that do not have this as their uh, resource. Um, they were um, very impressed and envious of our brand new operating rooms, uh, that state of the art, <clears throat> especially the physical size of them um, and all the um, uh, equipment that are associated with it. Um, and then they kind of pointed out too that we have really two strong um, members of our team in our um, trauma liaisons, both from neurosurgery and orthopedics, and that was Dr. Klima and Dr. Vivas. Um, they were kind of very impressed by their CVs and, and the job that they're doing to kind of help us move forward with American College of Surgery application process. Um, so some areas of improvement that they recommended. Um, when we knew we were going to go through this consultative visit, the, the college has different rules than the, the Florida Department of Health does. So we knew that we hadn't really done a lot yet to go through the American College of Surgery to, um, process to change our rules to uh, meet their requirements. So we knew that there were going to be some deficiencies. One of the most obvious ones is the American College of Surgery requires a backup call schedule. So they require that not only you have a neurosurgeon on call, but if that neurosurgeon is busy doing a surgery, you have another neurosurgeon able to back them up. And Florida Department of Health doesn't. So at this point in time, that's one of the weaknesses is that we have to develop an entire backup call schedule. So that'll be a work in progress. Um, some of the other things that they uh, recommended uh, as areas kind of for improvement were um, it's difficult to get busy surgeons to these meetings, so we're going to do a better job of, you know, trying to get them involved, especially in our performance improvement process. Um, the backup call schedule, as mentioned, um, and they wanted, again, to uh, see that there's less people admitted to the medical services with traumatic injuries rather than trauma service. Uh, and again, they're very into the performance improvement. So what they noted with our system is, although we're doing a good job with performance improvement, they want to see us do a better job. That's kind of their, their um, area of um, uh, where they concentrate their focus at this point in time. So they wanted to make recommendations for myself and the trauma program manager to attend courses to do a, a more thorough job with our PI process, and that's being done. So where do we go from here? Um, we're looking at, um, again, hopefully hearing from the state any day to become verified uh, as the state level two trauma center. Uh, the application process for the American College of Surgery are hoping to begin in the fall. And because of the kind of um, backlog of, of applications they're seeing, it would be probably about a year from now that we would go through their site visit for verification. So probably next fall, a year or so from now. Um, and then I wanted to share with you kind of a trauma success story. So one of the things is that we do for trauma is we have a monthly trauma grand rounds, which is our educational opportunity. We bring speakers, and we're kind of at this point bringing speakers from all over the country, national experts on things, uh, to help educate people on trauma. 
Um, every, f every few months, what I'd like to do is prevent, uh, present some trauma success stories. Um, and so that kind of keeps everyone involved. And again, trauma is very much a team sport, so it lets us know why we do what we do. Um, and so this is gonna be, I presented one trauma success story a couple months ago, it very, went very well, was very well attended. Um, we plan on doing another one in July. And this is kind of a sneak peek at one of our trauma success stories. So JA is a 27 year old guy. He was admitted February 5th after a head on motor vehicle crash where he was thrown, partially thrown out of the car. He had a ton of injuries, but the most severe were the dissection of his aorta. So he tore his aorta, he ruptured his diaphragm, he shattered his spleen and liver. Um, he had hip fractures, open elbow fracture, and multiple other severe lacerations. He also bruised, bruised both lungs and had multiple broken ribs. He, um, again, having the regional blood bank is an asset, so he actually got 92 units of blood in the first 24 hours, as well as another 100 units of other blood products like plasma and platelets. So he had almost 200 total units transfused in the first 24 hours. And you look at that, and if they don't make it, then people say, but what a waste of resources. But when they do, and you save a 27-year-old, then it's an amazing thing. So he actually had 10 surgeries, and that included trauma, orthopedics, vascular surgery for the torn aorta, um, and he went on to do well. He was discharged to our comprehensive rehabilitation unit on March 3rd, um, after about a month in the hospital. Uh, and then he was discharged from the CRU another three weeks or so later. Um, and he's been back in clinic and is walking, talking, and doing very well. So happy to be alive. That's great. So uh, that's all I have for you today. Um, and unless you have any questions for me, I just wanted to thank the board for the opportunity to give him this update. And we're glad we're here and that you guys are supportive and, and um, so on and so forth. And appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad you're here, too. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. We appreciate what you do. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, before, I, uh, before we move on, can I just uh, take a minute to thank yes. Dr. Brockhurst, who's walking out right now? <laughs> um, uh, I, will t I, I just I think it would be uh, we, owe it, we owe he and his partner, Dr. Ali, uh, quite a bit for uh, being able to bring this program to where it is today. Uh, operating at the high level we are and remembering that we've only been a trauma center for one year and I and I think it's just a remarkable um, asset that he has brought he and his partner both have brought to this community and this hospital yes. so thank you very much thank you okay David the Excel award So I would like to introduce everyone to our May XO Award winner, uh, Jan Wankowski. Jan, can you come up and join me? How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here. I'm going to say some things about you if that's all right. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Jan is our Excel recipient for May. She is an LPN in the cath lab in prep and recovery. She's an, been an SMH employee since November 1995. Her co-workers describe Jan as caring and professional, highly organized with an eye for detail. They also say she's extremely knowledgeable, an amazing resource for all team members, especially for new nurses. She always takes time to answer their questions. Jan takes, takes time with her patients too, to bond with them and explain the procedure, why they're, they're here to have and make sure they understand it. Her caring makes a difference. Co-workers say that when when patients come to the cath lab, they ask for Jan by name. They just love her. There's another special reason Jan is requested by patients and admired by her peers. Word is she's an expert at IVs, that no IV is too difficult for her. She is lovingly known as the IV vein whisperer in the cath lab. <laughs> so thank you very much, Jan, for being here and being our own IV and, uh, and um, vein whisperer. Thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. Congratulations. Jen, how Hi. are you? Um, I have the pleasure of uh, awarding you the award today. Thank you. Uh, the Excel Award, uh, the recipients are employees who model are models of excellence and consistently demonstrate the mission, vision, and values of our organization. So I guess a vain whisper qualifies, right? <laughs> <laughs> they are superior performers that make an extra effort in the quality and care of our patients and families in the community. The hospital board and the administrative staff of Sarasota Memorial Healthcare system recognizes Jan 
Wankowski, and I thought Di Virgilio, that now is Smith, so <laughs> there's no problem, with the excellent XL Award for the month of May 2016. Thank you for your continued dedication to excellence. Uh, signed today by David Beringer and Greg Carter, the chair of the Sarasota County Public Hospital Board. Congratulations. Thank you so very much. And I guess we're going to keep this. We're going to yes. explain that. Okay. So, Jan, we're mm -hmm. going to keep this, if that's all right with you, and recognize mm -hmm. you at Management Council okay. uh, at the coming up. But would you like to say anything? They'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. And we are Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. The Hero Award. Okay, so we also have a Hero Award today, and I'd like to ask Judy Schwein to come up and, sit and visit with me. Judy, you here? Okay, she's not here. Okay. I think that we'll, pass, we'll do this again uh, next month. Is that all right, Mr. Carter? That's fine. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, David. Our next item is the report of the medical staff. Dr. Karen Hamad, Chief of Staff. Thank you. We have several um, proposed motions, the first of which is approval of the medicine department rules. I move approval of the rules for the Department of Medicine as adopted by the department and recommended by the Medical Executive Committee. We have a motion and a second. Any questions, comments? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. Yes. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, next we have a proposed motion uh, regarding the approval of the anesthesiology privilege form. I move approval of the anesthesiology privilege form as recommended by the Medical Executive Committee. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. Yes. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, next we have a approval of the sedation privilege form. I move approval of sedation privilege form as recommended by the Medical Executive Committee. Second. Motion and a second. Comments, questions? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and lastly we have Addition of board certification requirement to the allied health professionals policy. I move approval of the addition of the requirement that allied health professionals be certified by their respective nationally recognized organizations to the medical staff allied health professionals policy as approved and forwarded for final approval by the medical executive committee. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. That's all I have today. Thank you, Doctor. It seems like the executive committee has been very busy. <laughs> Thanks again. Next is our auxiliary report. Ed Miller, auxiliary president. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been a very unproductive month for the auxiliary. Our program of granting scholarships in the name of Dr. G. Duncan Finley were awarded last Wednesday on May 11th. My thanks to the members of the board who attended that function. The auxiliary awarded $50,000 in scholarships, 10,000 each payable over four years to five very worthy recipients who desire to pursue a career in the healthcare field. Hopefully some of these persons will return to our area as well. This brings our grand total of scholarships to over $400,000. We also awarded $1,000 each to another three outstanding teenage volunteers, referred to as TAVs, also graduating from local high schools in the name of the Karen Sharp Foundation. Summer staffing, guess that time again. Volunteer Services is bringing in 105 teens this summer. This is a very popular program, and as such, further applications are being refused. We are full. They will be serving in the Courtyard Tower, the Gift Shop, 
clinical research and discharge service areas. And in closing, the auxiliary was also very pleased to be included in the support operations of the golf tournament. We thank the foundation for inviting us to be part of this event. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my report. Thank you, Ed, very much. That was a very nice ceremony the other day with the scholarships. It's very deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Next is our secretary's report, Bob Strasser. Board members to remember, the first is June the 7th, 8 o'clock board breakfast, 9 o'clock quality committee, 10 o'clock mission and planning, 11 o'clock human resources, and 12 o'clock governance. The other date is June the 20th, 11 o'clock review of financials, 11.30 peer review, and 1 o'clock public board meeting. And that's it for the month of June. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bob. Treasurer's report, Joe D. Virgilio. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, one item uh, today to deal with, and it's a motion in regards to bad debt and charity care. I move approval of the bad debts and charity care for the month ending April 30th, 2016, in the amount of $16,630,000. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. And now our operations report. We'll start with Bill Wolchin, our chief financial officer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the financial highlights for April. And with April being the seventh month of our fiscal year, uh, the fiscal year to date numbers represent seven months of activity. Looking at the system's operating revenue, for April we had operating revenue of $63,066,000 compared to a budget of $56,541,000. Year to date, operating revenue of $417,275,000 compared to a budget of $396,411,000. Looking at the system's total expenses for the month of April, 60,428,000 compared to a budget of 55,000, 55,303,000. Through seven months of the fiscal year, total expenses of 402,757,000 compared to a budget of 387,501,000. Looking at the system's Operating, revenue, operating income in the rating agency format for the month of April, 5,327,000 for an operating margin of 8% compared to a budget of 3,987,000 or an operating margin of 6.6%. Through seven months of the fiscal year, operating income of 33,928,000 for an operating margin of 7.6%, compared to a budget of 28,118,000, budgeted at an operating margin of 6.6%. <coughs> Looking at hospital statistics, this is year to date in fiscal 16. The average daily occupancy, 494, compared to a budget of 450. The average length of stay, 4.69 compared to prior years, 4.78. Admissions, 19,008 compared to a budget of 16,412. Continuing on with statistics, for the hospital, surgery cases, 12,659 compared to a budget of 12,241. And so far this fiscal year, we've had 1,973 births compared to a budget of 1,929. The hospital's outpatient registrations through seven months, 259,675 compared to a budget of 260,895. Emergency care center registrations 75,011 compared to a budget of 66,935. 
and through seven months this fiscal year, our case mix index for all patients is 1.87, and for Medicare patients, 1.97. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report, unless there's any questions. <coughs> Bill? No, thank you. Thank you, Bill, very much. And now our operations report from our Chief Operating Officer, Lori Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'd like to start with giving you an update on what we um, have called the capacity project um, for fiscal year 16. If you remember last year when we embarked on fiscal year 15, we were enjoying an 11% growth over the previous year. It was significant, it was char um, really challenging our organization and taxing our resources. And we had every suspicion that that increase would continue and that growth would be sustained. So we embarked on what we called the capacity project in which we knew we needed to create capacity for the organization through gained efficiency. And indeed, this year, our speculations came true and we have enjoyed in February and March a 13% in growth, growth over fiscal year 15 with an average daily census of 552 and 554 during our busiest months. So we really had two metrics that we looked at. We had many, but the two that I'm gonna report on today was really about how quickly we were getting patients through our organization. One was for those that were ready to be discharged, how early in the day could we get them to leave? Because if they were ready to go home, um, the sooner we could get them out the door in the morning created capacity for patients that needed to come in. So this first graph is really looking at our discharges before one o'clock and our goals really were threefold by the end of the fiscal year. We wanted to um, reach 35% by one o'clock as our threshold, uh, our target at being at 40% and our stretch by the end of the fiscal year being at 50%. And you can see some of those hash marks uh, along the graph were some of our tactics that we've put <coughs> into place to move us along. Really of note is um, last year our average discharge duration was five and a half hours on our flow units, which meant that the time the order was written until the patient left our organization was five and a half hours. Our goal this year was to get that to four hours, and I'm so delighted to share that we are currently at three and a half hours. The next metric is really about getting people into our organization from our emergency department. And so our goal was really to, admit, um, to reduce that time from the time the order was written to be admitted to the time that patient actually gets placed in a bed up on the unit. For patient satisfaction, once the decision is made to admit someone, they really want to be up on the floor. They no longer want to be in the emergency department. And you can see that our logistics center opened in March and we have been um, uh, continually re decreasing our time from patients from the ED to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, that first dotted line shows that our baseline for last fiscal year was 148 minutes. Our goal, a threshold goal was 130 minutes. Our target was 120 and our stretch was 115 which meant on average we were trying to shave off 33 minutes for every patient to get up to the floor. And I am delighted to share with you that at this point we have exceeded our stretch goal and we have been at 110 minutes for the last several weeks. So how did we do it? Part of it is that we created a logistics center. I love, lovingly refer to, the, refer to this area as our war room. It opened in March, and it is where we bring multiple functions under one roof and one leadership. We have patient pa placement, patient flow, hospitality, and transportation, both internal and external, all together to expedite our patient movement and to expedite our efficiency. But wait, wait, there's more. 
Within this logistics center, we are going to be launching something new called a transfer center to really expedite transfers into our organization. Many of you may not be aware, but we have been averaging 222 transfers into our organization per month. That's a lot of people coming from other facilities or from doctors that want to transport their, or transfer their patients from where they are to our organization. This transfer center will be utilizing the technology of Teletracker, and it's called the Access Management Suite. And quite frankly, it makes, takes away the barriers and provides an easy and more efficient mechanism to transfer from other hospitals or physicians to our facility. We will designate a des, um, one call, one number, 24 seven operation. So physician and other hospitals just need to remember that one phone, phone number to coordinate the transfers. It, it will be a recorded line in which we ask standardized information so we know that we can safely accept that patient and transfer them um, efficiently and effectively. Things like, do they need an ICU bed? Do they need to go to the cath lab? Do, um, who are the physicians on call that will need to take care of this patient? What are the blood products that we'll be needing? All this will happen through this transfer center. Our goal is really to make um, this an, as easy um, for everyone that wants to transfer their patients to us and to take our transfer admission flow to a much higher level. Also within our capacity project, we had something called Orchestrate. It is the teletracking software for our procedural and diagnostic areas. This is um, designed to stream low patient flow in a coordinated and very transparent fashion. In the, in the operating room, we know it's a very methodical process. So every patient needs to go to pre-op where they have lines started, a consent is signed, everybody is on board on what is the procedure. Um, that is where the patient will have their site marked for what kind of procedure they're gonna have. From there, they go into the operating room and we know that's where anesthesia will um, make sure they start their anesthesia correctly. The patient will get, be positioned, will be draped, um, uh, appropriate um, skin care will be done. The, su the surgery happens, uh, then the surgeon um, makes the incision. Once the surgery is done, uh, we know that what happens is the wound needs to be closed, it needs to be um, uh, dressed, the um, anesthesiologist will um, extubate the patient and begin the recovery. They will then move to the post-anesthesia care unit. All of those steps happen through every, through every patient along their course of their surgical stay. This software will actually create a very transparent um, um, milestones or benchmarks on that journey that's um, very transparent for everyone that's involved. So the OR will know when they're in the pre-anesthesia or in the pre-anesthesia holding area where they are in the process going. In a couple of minutes, I know they'll be coming into the room. The PACU will be able to say, I know they're closing and probably have a five or 10 minute window before they're getting rolled in. This will add to everyone knowing where the, the patients are in the process and improve, improve efficiency. Our anesthesiologists looked at the system and are truly excited about this and believe this will make for a much more efficient operation. And we um, started with, we are gonna be starting with the OR, but we'll be quickly expanding to the other areas of anesthetizing locations, including OB, and our endoscopy suite, um, cardiac cath, and radiology. The original go live date was August 1st. However, that's needed to be revised due to Florida statute. Given the powered data um, hardware requirements for the software, it needs to go out to bid. So that's pushed us back about back a bit. And we'll be going live on the 10th of October. So stay tuned for more. With all of this growth, many of our departments need more staff and the I uh, information systems team um, certainly falls into that category. 
and we are in the midst of renovating their areas. And we will start seeing in our organizations walls starting to come down to accommodate more people in our square footage because we know walls sometimes don't make up for the most efficient square footage per person. And we are putting in cubicles for people um, so we can get more efficient space for workers. Um, and you'll see on the right, this is the uh, new space for our information systems. And we were able through this um, floor plan to add three more FTEs to that work area. Moving on to our angiography um, room in radiology. This was a $2.3 million um, capital investment. It will be completed by the end of July. On the left, you'll see we are starting the preparation and installation of that third angiography machine in radiology. And when it's done, it will look like the one on the right, which is our second angiography suite. Moving from radiology to critical care, um, as you are aware, we are updating our ICU pods. The demolition has started on the first ICU pod. This is the final phase of this pod refinish project. As you know, we are updating our medical booms, lights, casework, flooring, and paint. After this, we will have another two pods um, that are on schedule. A total of 26 beds will be completed in this final phase with 36 beds already completed. At the end, this will give us 62 beds. And again, this was a $2.3 million capital project. Moving from critical care to urgent care, our St. Armand's Center is uh, quickly coming to life. It is on the corner of Ringling and Adams as you approach St. Armand's Circle. It is an 8,700 square feet facility, $8.6 million of capital dollars committed to this project. It is two stories, but has the potential to go to three. And of course, it has our standard urgent care services, general radiology, laboratory, and anticoagulation. This will be operational by the end of October. So every year there is Laboratory Week, and during this week we have an award named after Hazel Pode. Hazel was a manager in our laboratory between 1969 and 1999. Unfortunately, I did not have a chance to meet her, but she always had a smile on her face and, was, um, and is remembered as being an individual who made other people feel special and important, and she believed firmly that the patient comes first. She was loved by everyone who knew her, and every year we have an award in her name. And it is a peer-recognized award. We had numerous nominations, and I'm delighted to share that Olivia Fulkert is the 2016 Hazel Award winner. And she gets these beautiful flowers, as well as a picture and a plaque that goes on the wall. And then finally, as a trusted member of our community, we partner often with public safety. And this year, um, law enforcement has asked us to host the memorial service for fallen um, public servants. And unfortunately, there were five public um, service Florida enforcement officers that um, died in the line of duty. Two were of the human species, and the three were of the canine group. Um, but sadly, they all lost their lives last year. And we're delighted to um, allow them to have the memorial service here. And that will take place on May 17th. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Thank you all. Thank you, Lori, very much. Now we'll move to our committee reports. We'll start with the Quality Committee, Dr. Marguerite Malone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Quality Committee met on May 3rd, and it is a closed meeting per uh, Florida regulation, so we don't report on the contents of the meeting. However, we were introduced to Sharon Cropper as the new Interim Director of Quality who will replace Terry Nolan, who is leaving the organization. So we wish Terry lots of luck. Look forward to working with Sharon. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Finance Committee, Bob Strasser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Finance Committee met on May the 3rd. 
The first item on the agenda was an update on community health cooperation. Charles Bauman, chairman of the Community Health Corporation, gave a status report to the board. CHC was formed in 1986 to further the interests of the district and health care in the community in a manner that complies with requirements relating to partnerships and joint ventures. CHC participates in the following joint ventures, Cooperative Services of Florida, Bay Linen, and Bay Care Home Care. They also partner with Lee Memorial for negotiating purchasing contracts. The second item undertaken was the replacement of outpatient scheduling system. Diane Settle reported on updating the patient at scheduling system. We currently have a system that is over 20 years old. It now has limited support and will soon be out of service. We have 110 scheduling locations. We are looking at system that is patient and physician friendly. Timeline is October 2017. At this time, I'd like to propose a motion. I move approval of the purchase and implementation of the SCI scheduling system for a total cost of $1,870,000 with $1.2 million coming from the fiscal year 2016 capital budget and $670,000 coming from the fiscal year 2017 capital budget as recommended by the Finance Committee. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. There is one more <clears throat> item on the report, an update on supply chain. Hetty Payton presented overview of the operations of supply chain management and how they have worked for SM healthcare system departments and physicians to implement cost reduction initiatives. During the first quarter of fiscal year 2016, 1.3 million of cost reductions have been implemented, which will result in annual savings of 5.2 million. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bob. Next is Investment Committee, our Investment Chairman, Tram Hudson. Mr. Chairman, the Investment Committee met on May the 3rd. Uh, we considered a number of items. First, we reviewed the retirement plan investment uh, performance. Our advisor, Tim Sant, reported on the retirement plan performance for the period in, in March 31, 2016. Just a quick summary, the growth in assets saw varied performance, but were generally flat. Income assets were mostly positive. Diversifying assets were mixed. We, we've allocated two asset classes that haven't done as well, but he believes over a longer period of time they will get better. We closed the quarter with a market value of $325 million versus $322 million at the beginning of the year. Tim also reviewed the information his firm had prepared to show the fees charged by each manager and their performance compared to the index. He also reviewed information showing how the retirement plan would have performed had been fully indexed. This analysis included data for various assumed asset allocations. Tim reported that as of March 31, the SMH healthcare retirement plan had $69 million invested in the Russell Equity One Fund. The Russell Equity One Fund has underperformed the Russell 1000 index in 60% of rolling three-year quarterly observations. One of Tim's recommendations is to use a passive index fund, such as Vanguard Fund, which has a low tracking error relative to the Russell 1000 index and a low management fee of only eight basis points. Jim Meister moved to recommend board approval to replace the Russell Equity Fund with the Vanguard Index Fund, and Dr. Malone seconded that uh, motion. It passed unanimously. Uh, we also reviewed the board designated funds investment performance. Uh, just briefly, it showed our enhanced cash portfolio net of fees exceeded the benchmark by 41 basis points. Our intermediate fixed return net of fees over three months was 2.7%, and over the past 12 months was 2.65%. Uh, that concludes my report. I do have a motion to make for the board, if I may do so. Uh, I move approval of the change in the SMH 
retirement plan investments from the Russell Equity One Fund to the Vanguard Index Fund as recommended by the investment manager and the investment committee. Second. Yeah. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? <laughs> if not, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion is passing. Thank you. I'm not sure if Daryl had a question or. Yes, sir. I remember when Tim was giving his, his brief, he showed a preference for emerging market markets. We question that. Has he given you any feedback on that yet? Uh, we have not received any feedback on that as of now. Did you seek some? Too? Well, absolutely. <laughs> Our next investment committee is not scheduled until November. We have talked with the chairman about our uh, staff about possibly scheduling an investment committee meeting over the summer or early fall to review some of those matters. Thank you. Thank you for your report, Tarim. President's report, David Verinder, CEO and President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to start today um, looking at our organizational report card for our fiscal year to date through April uh, 2016. So we always start in our service pillar and we look at our HCAP scores um, and we have a goal of being uh, 9 out of 11 of our, our indicators being at greater than the 50th percentile. Uh, we're a little bit short of that at 7 out of 11 and I'll show you the detail behind that in, in, in a minute. On the outpatient side, we, we have a goal of hitting um, 55 out of 58 of our domains at 50 percent or greater. Uh, we're one shy of that right now. We're at 54 out of 58. Once again, show you the, the detail to that. In the people pillar, we're, uh, our goal is the turnover of um, part-time and full-time uh, staff to have a goal of 34 percent or less uh, of our hires, um, our new hires being turned over. And I'm, I'm We'll tell you we're a little bit higher than that goal right now. We're at 36.58 percent. I know there's a good bit of teamwork uh, going on with our HR department, with um, our COO right now to, to get that number down. In the quality pillar, uh, we have a goal of having our infection prevention, our overall um, uh, standardized infection rate of being less than 0.95, the national average being 1.0. I'm happy to report that we did achieve, achieve, have achieved that so far this year at 0.89. So really uh, doing well there. And our finance pillar, as uh, our CFO, Mr. Wojan, um, reported on, we have a goal of, uh, or a budget of 5.2 percent, and we're, we're projecting to exceed that by the end of the year at 5.9 percent. In the growth pillar, we have our inpatient admits plus our observation patients, the goal is being 35,301. We are exceeding that at this point. We're at 39,444. In outpatient registrations, we have a goal of 747,000. We are exceeding that as well, projecting to exceed that by 755,000. So when we look in our HCAP scores, the um, column that, that starts with FY16, October to uh, April, you see we have, uh, we, we've met it in seven categories, which, which is to say we've missed in four different categories. There are teams of people that are working on, on these various categories right now. The, the, the one that took the biggest hit really was around quietness of the hospital environment, uh, which we fell to uh, a, 55, a score of 55. Um, just keep in mind that right now that the data that's going into this are our February and our March uh, patients. And so we are, uh, this is the toughest part of the year. And when we had a roughly 20% uh, increase in our emissions, we did have to put a good bit of people in semi-private rooms, which causes an effect on the um, quietness. But lots of teamwork going on around this and lots of meetings throughout the uh, organization. On the outpatient side, uh, we, like I mentioned a minute ago, we have missed um, on four of our indicators, that all four of those being in the ambulatory surgery center our, um, line, and uh, we are meeting with that staff right now and, and putting some action plans in place uh, to address that. So more to follow. We shift over to people. We have our, Ameri we, we participated in, like we do every year, in American Cancer Society Relay for Life. Um, we, have, we were pleased to support three Relay Life events in April, downtown Sarasota, Northport, and Venice. 
uh, to raise funds for research and local programs. Our participation ranged from sponsorship to fielding teams to placing and lighting hundreds of luminaries for an overnight event. So thank you for all the team members that showed up for that. We also, uh, this past April 30th, had our annual NICU reunion um, for our tiniest patients. And this is something that we do every year. So uh, kids that uh, have come through our NICU and, and have grown up to be uh, wonderful people uh, come together once a year and have a reunion. The, the major attraction each year is for patients and families to reconnect with a neonatologist and nurses who provided care for them. This year we saw 50 patients ranging in age from two weeks to 15 years, 100 adults, which included parents and grandparents, and then of course lots of siblings. In 2015, SMH cared for 464 babies in our NICU and had an average length of stay of uh, 10 days. So thank you for all of our staff that care for these children. We were also happy to have our service anniversary uh, celebration. So each year we're proud to recognize hundreds of staff marking milestones at Sarasota Memorial. Last month we recognized employees who've served our organization for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and even 40 years of service. Congratulations to each of their incredible service to our patients, visitors, and community over the course of their tenure. And you may notice in the bottom picture there, standing center is uh, Jan, our own CNO, Jan Mock, who uh, celebrated her 40th, and I think you're well into your 41st year right now. So thank you, Jan. Now normally we don't recognize the winners of the um, SRQ Magazine Women in Business Hear Me Roar category, but this year we um, are pleased to announce that our own Chief Operating Officer, Lori Lang, was among those uh, winners. So, Lori, congratulations, and, and you're in good company there. I'm sure everybody has heard that we're in the middle of our EPIC campaign with the foundation, which is, gives our employees the opportunity to donate money to the, work, to the hospital. And it's really amazing how much uh, this generates each and every year. But one of the events that we, we have gotten to have for the last several years is, a, um, we call it a celebrity bartending event at, at Libby's. It's gonna be May 25th, 2016 from five to eight. I just would encourage anybody to, to come out here. There's uh, Dr. Hammond's in there uh, as, a, as a guest celebrity, myself. we <laughs> serve you a beer. Um, myself, Lori, and, uh, and several other people. And uh, we, we would sure love to see anyone who can come out and give to a great cause. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to be invited back. I had a little heavy pour, so uh, if you find me, you, 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 it's a better, it's a bad, it's a good person to find. <laughs> Moving into quality, um, I'm honored to, to say that SMH Home Care has received a five-star rating once again this year. Um, really a remarkable um, uh, achievement when you recognize that only 3% of all home health uh, agencies in the nation are five-star rated. And so thank you uh, for everyone who participates in that. Our respiratory care department uh, recently scored a perfect CAP survey. Uh, so congratulations to our, our Department for Deficiency-Free College of American Pathologists uh, survey. Um, which is, is quite an accomplishment. The blood gas testing services in this area required a department to maintain fully certified CLIA cert certificate, which is subject to the CAP survey. So thanks to everybody who participated. We also, this past week, had our Nurses of uh, Excellence Awards kick off for uh, 2016 Nurse Week. And uh, you can see we, we honored, we had the opportunity to honor many of our nurses throughout the organization here. Um, and uh, it really uh, is, a, is a special week for us all to be able to just say thank you. So thank you, Jan, for everything you and Connie both do on that. May is stroke month. Um, so we uh, advertise and we, we want to make sure everyone's aware of the warning signs that go along with stroke. Uh, the SMH uh, stroke team hosted an open house on May 10th uh, to increase awareness of how to spot a stroke. Clinical and non-clinical staff, as well as patients and visitors, were invited to spin the stroke awareness wheel and test their knowledge. So thank you for everyone who participated there. I always like to just show our upcoming uh, events, our Health Connection 
Uh, so we have uh, various things like smoking sensation classes, healthy eating, recipe makeover, uh, pharmacy talk, healthy living with uh, CPOD, and uh, sunburn, skin damage, and uh, skin irritations. So, um, you know, feel free to take a look at that. This is all on our website, and um, we, we appreciate you uh, coming out if you're so inclined. As has been mentioned several times today, we had our 50th annual um, Sarasota Memorial Healthcare Foundation Golf Tournament. Uh, once again, it was a, an incredible success. We had, um, you know, fully sold out uh, two golf courses full of teams. Appreciate everyone being there. Dr. Hammond, appreciate you uh, being uh, driving a golf cart and serving along the way, and, um, and everyone who was there. So thank you very much. In our growth section, SMH helps welcome uh, newcomers to Northport. On Saturday, May 7th, the city of Northport hosted Northport um, Newcomer Day, an expo-like event uh, held several times throughout the year for residents and visitors to learn more about this up-and-coming community. Local officials and leaders throughout the county, uh, the county were on hand to welcome the several hundred attendees who turned out. Sarasota Memorial looks forward to this event and the opportunity to introduce the uh, community to our services and our physicians each and every year. So we have our revamped uh, rehab pavilion model room, uh, which is reopened for tours, uh, located over in, in, in uh, Met Arts building. So after receiving feedback from our staff and visitors, our rehab pavilion model patient room has been renovated and is again ready for viewing. Our goal is to ensure the most user-friendly, rehab-focused design in Sarasota Memorial's newest state-of-the-art facility. The model room is located on the first floor of the Med Arts uh, building and tours are available by appointment on Tuesdays and Thursdays. To arrange a tour, please call our architecture and, um, department and there's a phone number. We're still planning on opening uh, the rehab pavilion uh, at the end of 2016, but I would encourage anyone uh, with an interest in that to go by and take a look. It's really uh, amazing what, what those sample rooms look like. This is just pictures of our um, current construction on the rehab pavilion. So you can see the crane is out there now. If you walk by, you'll see the first um, floor going in uh, and um, really starting to make some good uh, movement on that. Mr. Chairman, that's the end of my report. Thank you, David. Any questions or comments for David? Okay, thank you. And next, I don't think we have anything on the consent agenda today. Do we have any public comments, Karen? No public comments? Legal matters, Carol Ann? I have no report. Thank you. Does anyone have any other business? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.